Hello everyone, in this video I just wanted to share and prove a nice little result about elastic collisions between particles of equal mass in classical mechanics. So the situation we're dealing with is that we initially have this with one particle moving with a velocity of u and another particle just sitting there stationary and I've said that the mass of both particles is just m. Now consider extending the straight line defined by the velocity vector u. That line that I'm sketching on there, that is just the line along which the first particle will move until the collision. You'll see that that line doesn't go through the center of the second particle. Now what's the implication of that? Well, when the particles do collide, there will of course be a force acting between them, but because their centers are vertically offset, right, relative to that velocity vector u, the force acting between the particles won't be acting in the same direction as the velocity vector, and that means that this is not just a one-dimensional problem. After the collision, the particles won't both just be moving along that same horizontal line, they're going to bounce off each other with two different velocities going in two different directions. So that's what I've illustrated down here, where after the collision you have these two different velocity vectors v and w pointing in different directions. I've also defined the angle between them to be theta. Now the interesting result is that if this is an elastic collision, in other words if kinetic energy is conserved, then the angle theta is always 90 degrees, so the particles will always be moving at right angles to each other. Now the proof of this result is actually quite nice because it only really involves two equations coming from the conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy. So let's consider those two conservation laws and see what we get. So the conservation of momentum of course straightforwardly implies that mu is equal to mv plus mw. Here's where we use the fact that the particles have identical masses. We just cancel the m's from both sides and we find that the u vector is just the sum of v and w. Now what does that mean geometrically? Let's draw a little vector diagram to understand what's going on. Your u vector, I'll enlarge it a little bit, but I'll keep it in the same direction as in my original diagram. There's your u vector and we said v was kind of pointing up and to the right, something like that. So let me label my v vector there. But if u is equal to v plus w, that means w must sort of close the gap between v and u. In other words, it must go from the head of the v arrow to the head of the u arrow like this. Let me just label that arrow with a w. Now this works because you can see that moving along the u vector is equivalent to first moving along v and then moving along w, and that's just how vector addition works geometrically, right? You have to put the vectors that you're adding together uh, head to tail, then the result of adding them together is from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second vector. So the key point that we get from this conservation momentum equation is that u, v, and w form a closed vector triangle as illustrated in this diagram. So what about conservation of energy? Well, there's no potential energy involved here, so we just have to think about kinetic energy. So we get half mu squared plus zero because the other particle is stationary uh, is equal to half m v squared plus half m w squared, where the notation I'm using here just means that u is the magnitude of the u vector and similarly for v and w. So of course the halves and the m's cancel uh, and you get u squared is v squared plus w squared. Again, you only get this if they have equal mass. Um, things are more complicated if they don't, but let's make that simplification here. Now we already know that u, v and w form a closed triangle shape, but now we have another relationship between the side lengths of that triangle, u, v and w. And of course you'll recognize it as Pythagoras' theorem. And so this angle here on my vector diagram, if we call that alpha, this the fact that u, v, and w obey Pythagoras' theorem immediately tells you that alpha is equal to 90 degrees, right? It is a right-angled triangle. How is alpha related to theta though? Well, all you have to do is take this v vector, make another copy of it, and move it along this line. Because vectors, you're always free to move them around, right? They still This vector is still v, even though we've moved it up here. Then you can see that this angle here is theta, the angle between v and w, and it's clear that theta and alpha are on a straight line. They add up to 180 degrees, and so if alpha is 90, then theta is also 90 degrees. So there you go. It turns out that the particles bouncing off each other at right angles is a simple consequence of conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Final point I want to make is notice that I've been talking about particles for the whole video. In other words, we're kind of ignoring the physical extent of the objects that are colliding. So does this result only apply to particles, or does it also apply to things that we would actually find in the real world? Well, all of the reasoning that we've gone through would apply equally well to smooth spheres. In other words, spherical objects 
conflict but don't experience friction when they come into contact with each other. However, things become more complicated if you're trying to deal with arbitrary shapes because in general, you could get some rotational motion starting after the collision as well. If the force that acts um, between your two objects during the collision doesn't act through the center of mass of both particles. Now, while that wouldn't change your conservation of momentum equation and your velocity vectors would still form a closed triangle, it would introduce extra rotational kinetic energy terms into your energy equation. And so um, the side lengths wouldn't necessarily obey Pythagoras' theorem anymore. So we can say that this result applies to particles and to smooth spheres, but not to arbitrary objects. In my next video, I'm going to be looking at collisions between smooth spheres again, but this time dealing with arbitrary masses and arbitrary initial velocities and going into much more mathematical detail. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you again soon for that next video.